and welcome to Mathematics is a Creative Endeavor, how placing hard, product, how placing hard problems in new contexts leads to mathematical insight. My name is Vicki, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229-3239. We do encourage everyone to use the audio broadcasting, but if you would like to join the teleconference via the phone, you will need to close the audio broadcasting box and request the phone by clicking on the phone icon below the participant list. It will then provide you with the dial-in number, along with the event number and your personal attendee ID number. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question at any time throughout the presentation today by simply clicking on the question mark icon located on the floating toolbar in the bottom right side of your screen. Please send questions to all panelists. Today's webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be made available to everyone through their email. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce you to your first speaker for today, Tom Kelly, Head of School. Tom, you now have the floor. Thank you, Vicki. Good evening and welcome to our webcast. In honor of Horace Mann School's 125th anniversary, we're pleased to invite you back into the classroom through a series of webcasts by HM teachers on subjects of interest to alumni from every era. Tonight's webcast is the second in our series. It features teachers Christopher Jones and Charles Worrell of the Upper Division Math Department. They'll be speaking on the topic, Mathematics is a Creative Endeavor, How Placing Hard Problems in New Contexts Leads to a Mathematical Insight. In a moment, you will learn from these teachers to think about a clock or a car's odometer, things common to our everyday lives in ways you may have never perceived them before. And that is the true essence of Horace Mann School's mission of nurturing the life of the mind. Whether we're working on a problem in math or science or a way of expressing ourselves artistically, whether there's an ethical or personal dilemma we all eventually face, tonight's experience will inspire us with the message and the tools to receive our questions from new perspectives and hopefully find our answers. Thank you for tuning in. Please be on the lookout for news about upcoming webcasts in this series. On behalf of Horace Mann School, past, present, and future, may I wish you nothing but the best in this holiday season and coming new year. Chris, Charles, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, this is Charles Worrell. Uh, I've been a math teacher at Horace Mann for about 15 years, and, uh, and this is my mentor. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Mr. Jones, or Chris Jones. Uh, you guys can call me Chris when, uh, when we next see each other, since you are uh, alumna and alumni. Uh, this is my 20th year at Horace Mann, and it's been a great ride, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. And I'm joking a little bit in, in a way, and not so much in a way when I say Chris is my mentor, because when I started at Horace Mann uh, 15 years ago, uh, Chris was the official person who, uh, who was assigned to give me advice and tell me what kind of clothes to wear to various events and whether or not I was doing a good job. Um, Always take lunch is what I told you. Always don't skip lunch. And I skipped lunch for the first three years probably <laughs> in a row. Um, but today we thought we would start by talking a little bit about our history, actually, just as it relates to our understanding of how math uh, fits into um, intellectualism in general. Um, yeah, I mean, it's no secret that we both really enjoy mathematics. We, in fact, we love mathematics, which is why we're happy that we chose math teaching as a profession. But it sometimes is hard for people to articulate what it is they love about math and about math teaching. So. We're going to spend a few minutes kind of riffing on that and hoping that we'll be clear in, in things that might resonate with those of you who are in our classrooms and those that continue to be in our classrooms about what, what kinds of moments we try to create for you guys. I think it's a truism for most teachers of math that they don't really understand any subject in math really well until they teach it for the first time or until after they teach it for the first time. And I remember teaching um, geometry for the first time my first year here and just every day being amazed by the, the theorems and the connections and, um, and the sort of blossoming understanding that I had of how ideas fit together uh, in very complex ways. It was all mathematics that I knew, but I really didn't perceive how deeply connections um, worked until I, I taught the class. And that process of, of ever deepening understanding and seeing connections uh, continues to this day. And as one gets deeper into one's own subject, 
there are certain pockets where all of a sudden you realize there's something special going on here. This is a rich field to, to harvest. This is a place where I want to spend a lot of time with my students, and we're going to talk about that richness right now for a little bit and what that richness comes from. Because from our perspective, it's not that something stands on its own. It's usually that it's connected, and that was what, what, what Mr. Wool said a second ago. It's connected, and usually it's connected because, because it's not singular. It's because it can be viewed in more than one context because it can be viewed from multiple perspectives. Uh, a lot of the math that we do is what I call contextless, and then we place a context on it, and all of a sudden there's a story, a narrative that evolves from that. And one of the beautiful things is that when you have a hard problem, uh, sometimes you're looking at it from one perspective, and it's just so naughty, so thorny, and you're not sure how to get at it. And by changing perspective, um, which, which to us is an aesthetic process, um, it's so beautiful to do that, um, it, it's, it turns out that it's not just aesthetic, it's also incredibly practical because by changing perspective you can turn a very hard problem into one that is just natural and simple. I, I hesitate to use the word easy, but, but elegant is the word we usually use. Charles and I were talking about, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a, a cliche, I just call him Charles, I'm going to jump back and forth, so you have to excuse me on that, but um, it's, it's a cliche to say that when you're teaching mathematics, you're not just teaching the content, you're teaching the thinking and the habits of mind, but we actually believe that. And the idea that you can actually teach your students to think uh, from more than one point of view. We think that's a really important life skill. And when we're just sitting back and thinking about it, you're like, pretty much all the big ideas that have ever come to be have come from somebody looking at something from a different perspective, not doing what everybody else was doing. Yeah, and that idea of content versus versus um, style of learning, I think, is really important. Uh, some of you probably listening had Mr. Jones or Mr. Worrell in class, and I, I wonder how many facts you remember that we taught you. Probably not that many. Um, but we hope that what you did learn from us to some extent, and from all of your horseman teachers, we hope, is, is how to approach an unknown situation with creativity and with an ability to change context in a way that's useful for you. Um, so we think, we were talking about this um, yesterday in preparation for this talk, and, and we, were, we were thinking about some fam very famous people, um, some geniuses in history who, who we think uh, our, were geniuses or, 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 um, or did things that merit the word genius that, that had to do with changing context. Um, there are mathematicians like that, certainly. Archimedes is, is one of the mathematicians um, that I think of first. Uh, he's an ancient Greek mathematician, as most of you know, who uh, very famously figured out how to find the volumes of very complicated objects, um, difficult objects to find volume formulas for, by not thinking about volume at all, but instead deciding in his mind to think about the weight of the objects and how they would balance on a, on a balance. Um, and he was able to, to change perspectives in that way and prove some of the most beautiful theorems uh, in the history of mathematics. The, the other sort of classic example that comes to mind is, is when, when you hear Einstein or you, you read Einstein having said, you know, I wanted to think about what was going on and so I placed myself uh, on the light wave, if I were riding a light wave, what might I see? Um, and there's a, this whole notion of, of, of relativity and relative speed. There are you know, certain questions that I go back to that I love to ask students where there's an implicit understanding that you're watching the problem. Say it's a, a problem in a river. You're watching the problem from the banks of the river. And there's so much going on. It's really confusing and complicated. But if you make the jump, to place yourself in the river, all of a sudden one piece of motion has disappeared and everything simplifies and the new problem that you're solving is a much simpler one. And that kind of context change is, is really a beautiful moment. And the idea is not to tell the students to do that, to make them struggle and hope that they can make that jump or when you do make that jump for them that the next time they have an opportunity to look at something from more than one perspective, they'll take it. And there are some moments that, that Chris and I both um, have, have talked about in the history of our teaching when certain students have made particularly beautiful and elegant use of, of that idea of changing perspective, and they do it on their own. Um, you know, I think that we can claim uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, credit for, for having given them some examples of how to do that, but they've used their own creativity in this context of being able to change perspectives to solve some problems in beautiful ways. 
Um, and that's, that's one of the most satisfying and, and wonderful things about being a teacher uh, in the Horace Mann Math Department is to, to have those moments to see kids really use uh, their abilities in a way, in a style that, um, that allows them to solve some of the hardest problems um, that, that I can throw at them in the most beautiful and elegant ways. I mean, if, if we're going to make a couple kids blush if they're out there, but uh, uh, Mr. Wall and I often joke about when we're trying to figure out uh, the, the easiest way to compute a particular vector trip um, in PCBCH. The uh, well, there's well, there's well, there's that, but then there's also we joke. Oh, just put a fulcrum between the two points. Oh yeah, and that's uh, that's 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 that's, 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 that's Krishanu saying. Krishanu saying. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, just imagine a fulcrum there in the which way. And that's our, it's that's, that's Krishanu acting as Archimedes actually. That is exactly it. what it is. He's saying I'm just exactly weighing it right it there, is. and that's why you yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's what is referred to as the Clapperman method for finding the two points of of least distance on two skew lines in three space. And uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's really pretty, and uh, it, it, it's preserved. And we save it each year to, to to share with the new students, actually to see if we can elicit it from them first. But eventually, we have to share since it's it's a it's a pretty complex idea. But it's complex in one way and simple in another. And he took the tools that we that we gave him, and he combined them in his own unique way. And, and what turned out to be a really beautiful piece of mathematics. Yeah, and I. I think that's a good lead into what we're going to do. We've got four four uh, topics, four problems, I guess, that we're going to show you. Chris is going to talk about one, and then I'm going to do a couple, and then he's going to finish up with one. And we're hoping to show you what we mean uh, when we say that that some problems really are susceptible to um, to this this kind of thinking. Um, so I'll let Chris talk sure. about his. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to start off with with one that's fairly rudimentary, it's, uh, but but um, most of the things we're going to talk about have to do with with integers. Uh, and so we're going to start out with a counting problem, a combinatorics problem. So, um, and I'm in the middle of the combinatorics unit in both my 11th grade uh, classes right now, in the PCAB and the PCBCH. Uh, and so let's just take the real sort of rudimentary initial question you might ask, and that would be, suppose you go to, uh, you know, your Mick Fast Foods franchise and you need to select a meal. And now I'll put up a system of menus that you might... Uh, you might be confronted with. Let's see. Okay. So we see in front of us um, a set of choices. We have our main course column, our side dish column, and our beverage column. And you must choose one item from each column. And the standard combinatorics question is, well, how many different meals can you select? And I, I bet most of you out there are like, oh, this is so easy. I know what to do. Well, let, let's good. You should. But let me just make sure we remember why this is going to work, um, why, why we're going to be able to count that so easily. We'll, we'll think about a decision tree. Right? I've got to make my choice of my main course. I could choose the, uh, the burger or the nuggets or the rib. And now here's the key phraseology that I use. For each of those choices, I now have two new choices, my fries or my garden salad. Although, I don't know, have you ever gotten a garden salad at, a, at, never a, done it, at no. a McDonald's? No. A, a lot of fatty dressing yeah. that makes it not health food anymore. Well, maybe, I'll it. It. Yeah, yeah. maybe I'll get uh, one. Uh, okay, but for each of those two, but then branching off of each of those two, you now have for each four additional choices. So you, really you're just looking at the total number of paths you could take to get from the top of this diagram to the bottom of this diagram. And you have three choices. For each of those, you have two. And for each of those, you have four. So you have a total of 24 different meals that you could that you could build, and each meal corresponds uniquely with one of those vertical paths that we could take. So nothing new, but just a reminder of what what's called the multiplication principle of counting when you're beginning com a combinatorics unit. Okay, so this is sort of our, our, our ground floor groundwork, and now I want to tweak the problem, which is what we do all the time in mathematics. We take a problem and we make it a little harder by, uh, by changing things up. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to say, what if, what if we change the rules of the game a little bit? And now we say you may, you may opt out of some of the categories. Maybe you're not hungry enough for, for that McRib and you just want fries and a soda. Maybe, you know, there wasn't a Starbucks nearby and you wanted to try the McFlurry, whatever the, the coffee they have there now is. Or maybe you go in there and, you know what, I don't think I want fast food right now. You're going to get nothing at all. 
And the question is, uh, once we've tweaked the problem like this, what has happened to the total number of different meals that can be selected? And I'm being real generous in my definition of meal now, right? I'm calling the just a coffee a meal. In fact, I'm even calling the nothing at all a meal. So that's the question. That's the question. How many will there be? Now, if you think about it, if you want to organize your thinking, maybe I could break this into different cases. I could think, well, well wait, the old problem still applies. So all 24 original options are still in play. Maybe I could break them into categories based on how many columns are represented. I could choose from the first two columns, or the second and third, or the first and the third, and that would be a whole category. And I could say, well, maybe I could just choose from one column, or maybe I could choose from, from no column. So let's have a look, take a peek at what that might look like. Sure. Right, this is what I'll call the natural organizational solution. So yeah, there's a lot going on in here. I've got four different cases. I've got all three different categories represented, and, and we see the number 24, and really that's just the original question, isn't it? The original problem. But now in that second box right there, case two, the two out of three, that means I'm going to have two out of the three columns represented, and I'm not going to consider the third. So with the main and the side, if you remember, there were three choices and two choices. Well, I just apply that multiplication principle we talked about before, and there's six that involve a main and a side. Similarly, there are 12 that involve a main and a beverage, and there are eight that involve a side and a beverage. That gives me a, a subtotal of 20 in that box. Uh, case three, the one of the three, that's pretty easy. If I just have a main, I have three choices. If I just have a side, I have two. If I just had a beverage, I have, uh, I've got nine. I've got four, excuse me, and that totals to nine. And then the case four, which is the one possible situation, in one way you can choose nothing. We have to think about that as being one meal. And we add them all together and we get 60, right? And we, wow, that was quite a bit of work, but it's, it's, it's good to, to engage in that kind of organizational thinking. And we're happy with that number 60. But, um, but there's more going on here, right? So remember our original problem, example one? There were 24 possible uh, outcomes, 24 possible meals. And in example two, after doing that mm -hmm. careful thinking, we generated 60 total. And the question that I pose to my students, and I guess you guys are my students right now, um, all you out there, how is the number 60 related to the number 24? What's going on? Well, I invite you to change your perspective, to think perhaps about a different mode, a different vehicle, a different recipe I could have used to build the meals under the new set of rules in example number two. And here's the jump. The big leap is uh, related to one of the biggest mathematical leaps in the, in the history of mathematics. The leap is to imagine that nothing is something, that nothing is something. Think about our friend zero. Zero is, right? It, it is the is that is not, but it is. And what do I mean by that? Some of you, I hope, are smiling and you, you know where this is headed, but let's, let's see what I mean by that perspective change. Let's talk a little bit about how we could build those meals in the example two a different way. And what we're going to do is we're going to redefine rejecting a column as actively choosing an item called nothing from that column. So let's think about those funny meals that I showed you before. Just fries and a soda? Well, it isn't just fries and a soda. It's nothing from the main course, and then I chose fries and a soda. What series of choices comes from the just choosing coffee? Well, give me nothing from the main course. I'd like to have nothing from the side, and please give me my coffee. And I ask you out there, then what would the meal nothing at all correspond to? What decision tree route would you have to take in that one? And I think you all nothing. did. Yeah, well, nothing, 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 please. I, I, I don't know what they would do if you said that. If you went up to the counter and said, I'd like nothing and nothing and nothing. I don't know. They would, yeah. Well, you go, well, give me the toy. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's what you might have. Um, okay, so let's now see how this leads perhaps, hopefully, to the number 60 in a much more elegant way. I've revised my menu now. I don't think McDonald's is going to start doing this or make special because they don't want me to choose nothing. But what if we add? We add the choice nothing to each of the three columns. And now we have to do the same thing we did in the original column. I must choose one from each of the columns. Well, now how many choices do you have for the main course? Instead of three, you have four. How many choices do you have for the side? You have three instead of two. And how many beverages choices do you have? You have five 
instead of 4. And you multiply those together for the same reason we multiplied them together in the first problem, and now you got your number 60. Let's think about what happened here. This is the fundamental relationship between the original question and the new question. Your old one was 3 times 2 times 4, but being allowed to opt out is equivalent if you change your perspective to adding a new choice called nothing. And that makes the second problem really the same as the first in some sense in its form, but it required that we look at it a different way. It turns out that this thinking of nothing as something in combinatorics has lots of applications. I'll throw this out to you guys real quickly. Any number theorists out there, if you're trying to figure out how to count efficiently the number of factors that any positive integer has, you need this idea. Right, so you can play with it if you want to. So now I will pass the baton over to, uh, to Mr. Worrell here. And we'll get started on round two. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, about something completely different in a way, though it does actually touch on, on some of the same things that, that Chris did, uh, I guess not surprisingly, because um, math is connected. Um, there really are no islands uh, in mathematics. Um, there, there really are no single facts. Uh, in the sense that, that they're always connected to other things, and there's always different ways of looking at what seems to be a single fact. And I think that um, I'm going to actually go to my first slide here because it asks kind of a funny question uh, or, or says something kind of funny coming from a math teacher who loves math. Some people say that math is boring, and there's proof for that, um, lots of proof for that, I'm sure. Maybe you can think of some things in your own math histories where um, a teacher taught you something and, and you thought, well, that's a really boring idea. Um, I have had the experience of teaching many, many different grade levels and many, many different uh, simple and complicated ideas. And uh, the commutative property of multiplication is one that usually gets uh, a groan. Um, because uh, if you remember it, then, then you probably remember it as being trivial, uh, something very simple and, um, and so easily understood as to be pretty boring. If you don't remember it, um, I, will, I will point out now what it was. And, um, and I'll just say that when I first taught this property, or one of the first times I taught it, um, I wondered if it was boring too. And I, I thought, you know, I, I want to think more about why this property is true. And it turned out that it was not boring at all. In fact, it was very surprising. Um, so I'm going to share some things about that. Uh, here is the community property of multiplication. It says that for any two real numbers, A and B, uh, a times B is equal to B times A. I'm going to adopt the, uh, the dot symbol for multiplication. Chris had the, the more traditional cross symbol, but that dot means multiplication. And so this just says if you want to multiply two numbers together, you can do it in any order you want, and you'll get the same number. A simple example of that is 3 times 5 is 15, and so is 5 times 3 equal to 15. Uh, the typical response, I say, is a yawn, uh, even from a 6th or 7th grader who might be the person that you would be teaching this to. Um, another example of this would be, hey, 347 times 211. That will get you the same number as 211 times 347. Now, notice I haven't told you what numbers though, those are, uh, unlike with 3 times 5, because we all know what that is. Um, but we all trust that those are the same things. Um, the typical response to this is, duh, everybody knows this. Well, what's the difference between the duh and the yawn, though? I'm uh, just curious, qualitatively. One starts with a Y and the other one starts with a D. No, the, the reason one, why, one, there is actually... One is bored and one is annoyed. Is that, is what I I'm, think I, that's, is that the idea? Okay. I think All right. that's okay. the idea. Okay. You understand. All right. All right. Um, I'd like to take a little closer look at multiplication and to try to under, in order to understand why this property uh, works. Um, so I'm going to ask a question, what does 3 times 5 mean? Now, Chris and I actually were, were at lunch today, and, and uh, we were talking about this, and he understood it in uh, the opposite you're direction right, that you're I You're right. Did. I thought about it more. You're right. It's more just, it's more just the visual. You're, I, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Okay. All right. Things. I think that when someone uh, first invented the phrase 3 times 5, it actually came from um, another phrase. I think that probably someone said 3 five times. And the times is a, in, in mathematics, we talk about an operation. We talk about uh, making one number act upon another in some way. And so we usually put the operation between the symbols. But I think the actual linguistic way or the syntactical way that this was built originally was probably three comma five times. And, and five times added up. And so I say that three times five is equal to three plus three plus three plus three plus three. Uh, five times three, uh, therefore, should mean five, three times. And so we have 5 times 3 is 5 plus 5 plus 5. And so now we have to ask ourselves, if we believe that 3 times 5 is actually equal to 5 times 3, then we need to be confident that 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 is equal to 5 plus 5 plus 5. 
Well, I want to think about why we're confident about that. I'm going to add up the left-hand side of that equation uh, piece by piece. The threes added up go from three to then six, then nine, then 12, and then 15. On the right-hand side, when I add up the fives, I get five, then 10, and then 15. Now, I want you to notice something interesting here, or something mildly alarming if you think about it. Those numbers are never the same until the end. 3, 6, 9, 12, those are not the same as 5 and 10. This running sum does not match up until magically at the end it does. I thought about this the first time I taught the commutative property of multiplication, and I thought, why, why did that happen? I'm actually not so sure when I first think about it. More to the point, how confident are we that 347 times 211 is really equal to 211 times 347? Because if we translate that, that means that 211 347s added up gets you the same amount as, two, as 347 211s added up. Say that five times quickly, Bill. Uh, 211 347. 211 347 is equal to 347 211s. Yeah. I'm good at that. One time. Um, uh, trust me, in fact, because of the, the nature of the numbers I picked, um, though this isn't that important, if I did the running totals on this, they would not match up once until the very end, which now seems more like magic if, if you're just thinking about the, the chances of something like that happening rather than something obvious. So I want to consider, again, this very easy question. How can we see that 3 times 5 is equal to 5 times 3? Why are we really supposed to believe that? Just a moment. All right, well, in order to do that, I, I would like to actually provide some objects to think about adding up. So I picked the most natural objects I could think of, Dr. Kelly's. Um, I have. Uh, that was Dr. Kelly laughing, by the way. That was he's, in the, he's in the room. He is in the room, and he has actually already vetted my use of his image, um, though it does come out quite fuzzy. But I promise you that is Dr. Kelly. Um, I'd like you to consider uh, uh, three groups of five Dr. Kelly's. Now, this would be the right-hand side of the equation I was talking about. This is five plus five plus five. Now, my task is to try to see why this is also five groups of three. And I would argue that it's not very easy to see five groups of three. I see three groups of five very, very naturally. They're inside of those, those little uh, circles. Um, but the only way I could make five groups of three would be something kind of ridiculous like this. I circled them, and I numbered them. I circled the top group there, uh, which is one group of three. The second group of three, I had to take two from that original group of five, but then kind of include it with one of the Dr. Kelly's in the left-hand circle there. And then the third group, I, I hugged the edge and, uh, and caught three Dr. Kelly's. I like the idea of catching Dr. Kelly's. It's kind of fun. Um, I'm corralling him. Um, and I've got three more that sneak into that third circle, and then I've got three more on the bottom. Now, the big question is, how am I supposed to see um, that there really is the case that at the very end of this, notice there were three left over at the very end in that fifth group of three. Yes, there was a fifth group of three. That seems kind of surprising uh, when, when I'm so randomly pulling Dr. Kelly's from different places. Naturally, three end up at the end. So I'm hoping to see a better way to configure these 15 pictures to see five groups of three and three groups of five. And before I show you, maybe a lot of you know what the configuration is, I'd like to suggest that this is a moment that somebody a long time ago had to see for the first time. And when they did, they probably said, oh, how pretty. If you put the 15 Dr. Kellys into three rows of five each, then you see, I would argue, three groups of five Dr. Kellys. If you look at the rows, there are three rows. Each of them has five Dr. Kellys in it. And you also see five groups of three Dr. Kellys. Look at the five columns, and there are three of them there. And it doesn't matter that the final total is 15. You can forget that. That's not important at all that we know what the actual answer is. That's three groups of five and five groups of three. And I would argue that that's really smart. It requires a flash of insight provided by a change in perspective. In particular, 
it requires that looking at something wholly numerical, we decided to look at it geometrically. Technically, uh, it's a combinatorial proof. Well, for those of you out there, if you remember, you're proving that two, two values are the same without actually counting them. You're just showing yeah. the two representations. I think most number. people, if they were asked to prove that 3 times 5 is equal to 5 times 3, they would mention the number 15 mm -hmm. because that's what they both yeah. are. And what I've shown you is you don't need to count it up. You just show that they are represented in this, this counting scheme. Okay, so I'm going to show you a related question, um, which is about uh, one of the most famous uh, mathematicians in history. His name is Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, he is famously credited with solving the following problem after just a moment's thought when he was 11 years old. And it was to find the sum of the first 100 digits, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, et cetera, all the way up to 100. And the question is, how did he do this? Um, because it is legend that it took him about five seconds to do it. Um, and he was one of the very smartest people in history, and so actually it is possible that he just added them up in his head. I guess that's possible. Uh, no, but no, I'd like to argue that no, he, he thought he, of something he, beautiful. No, he says he did it this oh, way. Okay, okay. Yeah. he says he did it this way. Yeah. Um, so to do that, um, to try to figure out how Carl Friedrich Gauss did this, uh, let's take a first step of making the problem a little easier, which is often what we do uh, when we're encountering a very difficult problem. So we're going to add up just the first five numbers and try to come up with a way of, um, of seeing how to do this. So I have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, and I'd like to add them up. But I don't want to actually add and get the answer. I want to find a, um, I want to find a shortcut. I think we should try to use our lesson from the last problem and think geometrically. Let's change our perspective. So I'd like to see a way of organizing Dr. Kelly's, of course, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 of them. And so I have, I have made a configuration that is in the shape of a triangle, but I want you to see that the first row has 1, the second row has 2, the next one 3, the next row has 4, and the last row has 5. So this is a picture of the sum that we're trying to add up. Now, I'll notice that it was really easy to add in the last problem when I had a rectangular array of Dr. Kelly's. In this case, even though this is a very orderly configuration, and I'm reading at the bottom now, it's not a rectangle. So how does this help us count the Dr. Kelly's? Well, there is actually a very simple way to make a rectangle, but it requires us to do something special. It requires us to make a second copy of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 Dr. Kelly's. To see that we have two copies of the total number of Dr. Kelly's, which I'm about to make, Let's make them slightly different looking. Now, the thing is that I usually do this with little red balls and blue balls, but I decided to use Dr. Kelly's. And once I did that, I was stuck because I couldn't change the color of the Dr. Kelly's. So at the behest of one of my children, I decided to, to use a, um, a paintbrush uh, uh, icon on my, my computer, and I gave Dr. Kelly a beard and a mustache. And I would just like to say that I already ran this by Tom, and he thought it was funny. So. <laughs> So it's okay to. All right, um, so now I have right here uh, two copies of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 Dr. Kelly's, the clean shaven ones and the hirsute ones. And my apologies to Marcel Duchamp. Uh, what we need to do is to find a way to rearrange them into a configuration that can be easily counted. And can you see how to do it? I'll bet a lot of you can. Um, what I'm going to do is to move that second group on the right over to the first group on the left in order to make a rectangle, which will require me to turn the Dr. Kellys, who have beards and mustaches, upside down. Uh, hopefully you can see these. Those are the two sums, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. At the bottom of the screen, I say, now see that? I have two sums, two times that sum. And I'm trying to figure out one of those sums, but I have two of them. And it is equal to the number of uh, Dr. Kellys in this picture. But I notice it's a rectangle, and I know how to count the number of pictures in this rectangle. It's the number of Dr. Kelly's along the bottom multiplied by the number of Dr. Kelly's along the vertical edge. And we see that there are five along the bottom, which is the last number in the sum. Now, going along the, that vertical edge, you'll notice that there actually aren't five along there, maybe surprisingly. But in order to make the rectangle, I had to actually stagger the Dr. Kelly's over a bit and had to put um, one on top of of the, the unshaven one, uh, excuse me, the shaven one on the right. And so I ended up with six along the vertical edge, one more than five. And now I see that I have five times six Dr. Kelly's in this entire picture. But at the bottom, I can divide both sides of that equation by two, and I do see that one plus two plus three plus four plus five must equal five times six divided by two. 
which is 15, and I'm finally going to use that number because I got it in a clever way. I didn't have to add up. Now, you may want to add 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 in your head and make sure, but that's the answer. It's 15. Now I can go back to Gauss's problem, and it's actually really easy. We have 1 through 100 to add up. And so if we imagine a triangular array of Dr. Kelly's, which will be 1 through 100, it'll be a very big triangle. I'm not going to make a picture of it. Then we would have to put a second hairy copy of them that would fit with it to make a rectangle. The bottom edge would have 100 along it. The vertical edge would have 101, because we'd have to add one more, as we did in the last one. And we arrive at the formula Gauss almost surely used when he was 11 years old. His sum is really the 100 times 101, which is the area of the rectangle, divided by 2, which you can probably do in your head, and you get 5,050. And in general, we have a more general formula, which is provable from this Dr. Kelly rectangle. If n is some whole number, like 100, let's say, then the sum of those first 100 digits, 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n, is equal to half the area of a rectangle, the bottom edge being n, the vertical edge being n plus 1, and we divide by 2. That's a famous formula. The moral of this story, and I'll hand it back to Chris after I say it. The world moral? The world moral. <laughs> Uh, is that seeing arithmetic from a geometric perspective gives us deep insight. Uh, we're going to move on. Right, are you going to do yours next? Oh, excuse me. I'm not going to hand it back to Chris. Uh, but you might want to. You may have to go a little faster I'm going than you to, Okay, I'm going to um, move a little more quickly through my second problem. Excuse me, I do have two problems. Uh, yeah, my second we, one. We can go over we as well. Over okay, we're going to go a little over. Those of you, those of you that are out there, hopefully you'll stay with us. But we've got two more problems to work through. We've got the yeah. clock problem, and then uh, my problem. Which will problem. take about five more minutes. And yeah. then Chris's problem. Uh, my problem. I'm not going to. I will. I'll, I'll, I'll let it speak for itself. I won't, I won't Excellent. It Wonderful. Yeah. I'm going to show you something called a, uh, the clock problem. That's what I call it. Um, and in order to um, to do the clock, clock problem, I'm going to ask Vicki if she could play a little video that I made at about 6 a.m. yesterday morning um, at my kitchen table. So Vicki, could you play that video? I'm not sure if we... Vicki with us? Vicki, are you with us? I am. I'm getting ready to play that. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So she's going to play that. I just want you to notice that the hands of the clock move in a very particular way, and it's just going to be a 12-hour cycle that we're going to see. Um, and you're not really sure what you should be looking at, I guess, but I wanted you to see the hands moving around. And notice that there's no second hand in this example. There's just a minute hand and an hour hand. And one of them moves a lot faster than the other, obviously. And you might think about how much faster um, the minute hand moves than the hour hand. And I'll be asking you, in a moment, a problem based on this motion. Looks like things are changing, so maybe we'll see the video in a moment. Big buildup for a very silly video. But here we go. <laughs> okay, so we're seeing that... Mr. World controls time. I do situation. actually <laughs> control time. Um, and at 6.30 in the morning, uh, I wish I had been able to make it. <laughs> yeah, I wish I did control time. Um, but you'll notice that the hour hand is going to be going around just one time around the face of the clock. And the minute hand is going around, obviously, 12 times. And the thing to look at, actually, now that we've seen some of it, is that there's kind of a race going on here. The minute hand is going around a track, if you want to think of it that way, 12 times, and the hour hand is going around just the one time. Okay, so now you've seen it, and I haven't really been clear about what I wanted you to see, but now let's go back to the slides. My faithful assistant, Mr. Jones, will get us back to the full screen. Thank you. Uh, and here's the clock problem. If I can quick click and get it there. The clock problem is between 1 and 2 o'clock, there is a precise moment at which the minute and hour hands line up, one on top of the other, and the question is to find that time. Now, I posed this question years ago to, a, I think it was a ninth grade honors class, I think, um, if I remember right. And it was just, uh, it doesn't have much geometry in it really, other than the fact there's a picture there. It was just a problem I gave on the first day of school to give the kids a fun problem to do. And this picture I have here is actually not at the magic moment 
uh, when the two hands line up. It's just a few minutes before it. It's at, if you think about how the clock moves, the magic moment um, after 12 o'clock, because 12 o'clock is when it first happens, um, is not until after 1 o'clock. And so just a few minutes after this, uh, there will be this lineup time. Just a moment. Um, so, so I need to give you just one definition here. You're looking at a picture of, of 1 o'clock, um, and we will be referring quite a bit, actually, to that moment when the hands do match up. And I'd like to name that the confluence time, um, which sounds very grand, but it just means when the hands are on top of each other. So we're looking for this confluence time between 1 and 2. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to impose a number system on the face of the clock that's a little different than, than what's usually there. I've gotten rid of the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 o'clock numbers, and instead I'm going to put uh, 60 marks on, on, the, um, on the face. Yes, they correspond to seconds, but I actually want to call them some, or excuse me, to minutes. I want to call them something different. Uh, I'm going to call them click marks just to give them a name. Think of them as markings on a track. Um, pretty clearly this means that at 1 o'clock, the minute hand is at the zero click mark, you can see, and the hour hand is at the five click mark. Um, now, given this diagram, lots of students have an immediate guess as to what the confluence time really is. They think it's pretty obviously going to be 1.05, one exactly. And that's not right, but there's good reason for this. They see that the red hour hand, that hour hand is red, it's at the five click mark, and the blue hand just needs to catch up to it. And you can probably see quickly that that's a good guess but it's not quite right. And the reason it's not right is because during those five minutes while the blue hand is catching up to where the red hand is right now, the red hand moves just a little bit ahead. So at 105, I want to show you what we have. We have this picture, at 105. You can see that they have, the hands have not quite reached this confluence time. The red hour hand is still a little bit ahead. How far ahead precisely is an important question uh, to answer. Asked with more specificity, at what click mark is the red hand located at this precise time at 105? I know where the blue hand is. It's at the 5. But where is the red hand? To see how much, uh, to, and obviously the, the red hand has been moving more slowly than the, than the, the blue uh, minute hand. Let's see exactly how much slower it's going. In fact, let's go back to what I said before. Uh, let's make note of the fact that it takes the red hour hand exactly 12 full hours to make exactly one full circuit of the clock face. And now the blue minute hand takes 12, or takes in those 12 hours, uh, it makes 12 full circuits. That means the red hour hand is going exactly one twelfth as fast as the blue minute hand. Okay, so now we know that the red hour hand goes one twelfth as fast or as far, actually, is more important, as far around the circle as the blue minute hand goes. In particular, in those five click marks that the blue hand has gone, the red hour hand should have gone one-twelfth as far. So I'm giving you a little equation here on this next slide that says the click mark location of the red hour hand must be the sum of the five click marks old that it started position. at, which is its old position, added to the number of click marks we've added on, which is one-twelfth of those number of click marks that the blue hand has gone. So it's five plus one-twelfth times five, which is a little bit worrisome in the sense that it's not integral. This is not an integer. Um, it's going to be something between five and six. Okay. Um, now, at this moment, uh, we would like to find where the, uh, obviously we want to find the confluence time. And so we're trying to think about where that blue hand and red, uh, red hand are going to meet. Well, you see this process that we just embarked on of seeing where the blue hand goes to um, can be repeated. I can now think, in my simple-minded way, which I just, I just used, um, oh, the blue hand just needs to catch up to where the red hand is right now. Um, and so... I am going to think about the blue hand moving up to where the red hour hand is right now, which means it needs to move 1 12th times 5 click marks. Now, to do that, that is the location of the, um, of the blue minute hand 
is going to be 5 plus uh, 1 12th times 5. That's the click mark it's at. But the red hour hand will have moved ahead again. How far? 1 12th as far as the, the blue minute hand just moved. So the new location of the hour hand is the previous location, 5 plus 1 12th times 5, plus 1 12th of the distance that the minute hand just moved. So 1 12th times 1 12th times 5. Now, I'm not going to give you a picture of this because they're so close together right now. But the idea of this is that we just repeated a, a um, process that we had embarked on before, and we can do it again. This idea is enormous in mathematics, the idea of having an algorithm that you repeat over and over. We call it iteration. And the important thing to note here is that to find the confluence time, we could keep doing this infinitely, in fact. The hour hand is just a small distance ahead of the minute hand right now. And we can think about continuing to add. And so we end up with estimates for the confluence time that are getting closer and closer to the final answer. Our first estimate was that it would happen at the five minute mark. Our second estimate was that it would happen at the five plus one twelfth times five. I said minute, but I should say click mark. The third estimate is that it's five plus one twelfth times five plus one twelfth times that last amount, one twelfth times five. Continuing in the same way, we see increasingly accurate estimates for the final click location. The final location, I'm putting that in quotes, because you should see we never really get there by this method. At the confluence time will occur after an infinite number of repetitions of this pattern, and numerically that location is, and I'm, I'm changing notation here, I'm giving you exponents, because 1 12 times 1 12 times 1 12 times 1 12 is best expressed with an exponent, we end up with 5 plus 1 12 to the first times 5 plus 1 12 to the second times 5 plus 1 12 to the third times 5, etc. forever. Now, some of, you, some of you might remember, um, possibly, that this is what is called a geometric series, an infinite one. But I would like to, um, to admit that I'm giving this to 8th graders usually, or ninth graders, excuse me, and they have not usually seen this. So, um, they, my, my students usually don't know what to do with this. They need to find some other method. I mean, this is the answer, actually. Um, but we want a number. We want to know exactly what click mark we have to be at. And here is where a shift in perspective can give us an enormously satisfying clarity. Now, instead of thinking about the click mark the two hands are heading towards, let's only think about the rate at which the motion occurs. This is different. Let's further shift our perspective away from the rates of motion of the hands individually. So I'm not going to think about how fast one is going or another is going. Instead, I'm going to think about the rate of motion of the two hands together. Now, what does that mean? Well, I want you to think now about the confluence of the hands and realize that this confluence happens many times during the day. In fact, we can be much more precise than many times. We can count the exact number that occur during this 12-hour period, from just after 12 noon up to 12 midnight. Now, I was going to actually play this video again, but I think I'm, not, I'm going to skip that. So, Vicki, I'm not going to play this video right now. Uh, instead, I'm just going to invite you to think about the fact that over those 12 hours, you will see the hour and minute hand uh, have a confluence 11 times exactly. The first time after noon, think about noon as the starting position. Zero. That's, zero. That's the zero position. Not, not the natural. first time after that is between one and two. Mm -hmm. The next is between two and three. The next between three and four, etc. And the very last one will be at midnight. And so you will get a total of 11 of them. And this is the, the really important thing to realize. This is a rate. There are 12 hours that pass per each 11 confluences. And we can think of that as a rate of hours per confluence. It's 12 elevenths. Every 12 elevenths of an hour, there's a confluence. This makes the problem easy. Because I know at 12 noon, there's a confluence. This says just that in 12 elevenths of an hour, there will be another one. And so we can not only find the time between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock, we can just keep adding 12 elevenths of an hour. And we get, and I've changed things to minutes here to make it a little easier, but that's not hard. 
and we get that at 105 and 5 elevenths of a minute, which does not round nicely into, into seconds either, uh, we will have our first confluence. The second will be a little after 210, and then 316 and 4 elevenths of a minute, 421 and 9 elevenths, et cetera. And it all adds up uh, until you get to 1054 and 6 elevenths of a minute, which if you think about it, add on uh, one hour and uh, one hour, five minutes and 5 elevenths, and you'll end up with, uh, with 12 midnight. And this is where they all repeat. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that this gives us incredible mathematical insight because we have two ways of counting this time. I have changed uh, the fraction into fractions here and, and, and made this all in terms of minutes. So you might be a little surprised to see 60 elevenths on the right-hand side. But all that is is that is uh, the number of minutes um, that it takes after 12 noon um, for or after one o'clock, excuse me. Well, Twelve elevenths of an hour in minutes. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. Absolutely, that's in minutes. Yes, it is. Um, and all I've said is, it's in minutes. It's um, it's 12 elevenths of an hour in minutes. That's exactly what it is. And I've added, no, that's what it is. And this on the left is the number of minutes we said, the click marks, that we would need in order to get there. And so we have this remarkable result. The sum of an infinite number of positive numbers on that left is equal to something finite, 60 elevenths, which is an amazing thing for, for ninth grade geometry students to see. I'm going to pass the baton to Chris. Ms. Roy had a quick question for Mark. Okay. <laughs> Mark Bush wins his own bet. Uh, really? Okay. <laughs> which, was, which was to get the word asymptotic, asymptotic in there. And, and, it was, and he used it appropriately, though. Mark Bush, this is, in fact, asymptotic if you think about it. Yes, you're right. You're Mark right. will get a free sweatshirt. Right. There's a, there's a graph here that is approaching the Y value of 611, but never gets there. Well done. All right. Chris, to you. Thank you, Charles. Okay. So what I'm going to do for our, our last mathematical moment here is take, take – um, a pattern. A lot of um, a lot of what I, I I like my students to do is to look for patterns. I mean, that's what we do as human beings. We look for patterns. We want to explain them. That's what scientist scientists do. But mathematical scientists do them as well. The difference between the mathematical scientist is that after we find a pattern, usually we have an airtight explanation, as opposed to oh, we have some sort of theory that might have fit might fit the data to the best of our abilities. But here, oftentimes, we can actually explain. Uh, what it is about that pattern that makes it self-sustaining or what makes it structurally true. So I'm going to write some or show you a slide of just some real simple numbers in here. What happens if you just start playing around with adding and you just keep doubling the next number that you add? So this is going to look kind of familiar to, whoops, let me get to the next slide. Where are we? Uh, click right here. Oh, there we go. Excuse me. So look, I start with the number one, and hey, one equals one, that's not too uh, exciting, but then I add on the number two, and I get a total of three. And then I add on the number four, and my total becomes seven. And I add on an eight, and I get 15. And 16 is added on, I get a 31. And the question is, what is the relationship uh, between the numbers on the left and the numbers on the right? And if you're real good at doubling, you'll notice the numbers on the right are almost twice as big as the last number I added, right? In fact, they're just one smaller. And this seems funky. It seems like if I add powers of 2 up to a certain point, that I get the next power of 2 take away 1. So let's, let's turn this into a conjecture. I've got this conjecture written in two versions right here. So in words, the sum of all of the powers of 2, including 1, and remember, 1 can be written as a power of 2 if you're comfortable with raising to the 0th power, which means taking 1. But if you add all the powers of 2, starting at 1, up to a certain point, you get the next power of 2 minus 1, or 1 less than the next power of 2. And now if we want to turn this into a mathematical statement, this says 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 squared up to dot, 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 2 to the n equals the next, which would add 1 power to the, or excuse me, add 1 to the exponent, 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. And this, this is a fairly mature adult mathematical statement right now. It's got dot, dot, dots in the middle, which seems to imply that it uh, doesn't care how long the string of twos is. And the question is, how would you go about proving such a thing? Or in the case right now, I want you to be able to have a perspective shift where you see this as an ordinary, everyday statement. We're not going to prove this in a formal sense. I just want you to see this as actually something mundane and ordinary. It doesn't look so ordinary uh, unless you've studied geometric series. Which will make it uh, um, 
But I would like you to look at this and say, well, you know, that's, that's really kind of a trivial thing, which, as Mr. Rolls just said, it's triviality will make it interesting. Okay? So I'm going to take a, a little journey away from this for a little bit. We have to go and learn about a new perspective in order to be able to appreciate this. Okay? So we're going to take a little detour here, and we're going to start really thinking about how we group numbers. Um, we love the number 10. And I might ask you to think for a minute why we love the number 10. What's special about the number 10 to us as human beings? But we love the number 10. That's how we group things. In fact, we use it as the foundation for what we mean when we write out a string of, um, of, uh, of, of numerals. When I write 156, that's code. That's code for groups of 10. That 1 represents, oh, I have one set of 10 squares of 100s. And that 5 is code for, oh, I have five sets of 10. And that 6 is, oh, I have six ones left over. Or if you'd like to keep parallel structure, I have six 10 to the zeros. Okay? So now is where the jump needs to come. All right? So I'm going to let the slide speak for itself. Okay? <laughs> Look at Mickey. Now, I, I don't know if you're a, a big Mickey Mouse fan. I, I'm actually not. But, but he's useful to me right now. So I'm liking him right now more than I used Because, I mean, he's got a high-pitched voice. He's a little too jolly all the time, but he's got big but, feet. He's got big feet. But, but, yeah, I mean, he's got some interesting anatomy, if you think about him. <laughs> what, what, we love the His number 10. His ears are never behind each other. Okay, that's true. Yeah, he's, he's two-dimensional right now, too. But um, why do we love 10? You know, we love 10 because we've got 10 fingers, including our thumbs. That is the foundation of our number system. It is how we elementally counted when we made one-to-one -one correspondences between objects on us and objects in the real world. So how would this fellow, how would Mickey Mouse organize 156 objects? If you're in the Mickey Mouse universe, what's your favorite number? Eight. Eight. Your favorite number is eight. So if you're confronted with 156 dots and you're asked to sort them in the Mickey Mouse universe, how are you going to do that? Are there really 156 there? There are. Wow. I counted them. Wow. I mean, I, well, I, I put them out. You know, I would, well, that's, that's, yeah, I, I, I think so. I actually, okay. I actually put them out, but that's a good question. If these slides live on, that's, yeah, I'm right. see if I count it correctly. Right. But so this is what Mickey Mouse would do. If he was asked to organize, if he were, excuse me, asked to organize these dots, he would put them in this kind of a, an arrangement. We'd have a bunch of complete sets of eight and, uh, and some leftovers. But that's not really the whole story, because that's saying 8 is the equivalent of 10. Mm -hmm. What's the equivalent of 100? Well, 8, well, let's see, 10, 100, that's 10 sets of 10. So uh, in the, like a rectangle to in, me. In, in, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is a rectangle. We want yeah. squares. In the Mickey yeah. Mouse universe, 8 sets of 8 is really cool. Wow, that's, that's as special to Mickey Mouse as 100 is to us. So mm -hmm. we'd organize them a little bit more. He'd actually, if you look at underneath that bar right there, he'd organize them further and say, ooh, I've got two sets of eight squared sets of dots, three sets of eight to the first, and four sets of eight to the zero. That's, and I want some code, I think, for, yeah, for that. I want, I want now a way to express that number in the Mickey Mouse universe, and the Mickey Mouse universe is what we'll call a base eight universe. Yeah. So now let's think about what we started out. We have the number 156. In fact, the name of the number 156 presupposes base 10. Mm -hmm. Well, we have just proved something right now, and I will put the statement up and we'll look at it. We just proved that 156, now that subscript 10 means base 10, that 156 in the base 10 number system is the same as 234 in the base 8 oh, system. Different it's, codes for the yeah. same number of objects. Yep. The way in which we represent numbers, it changes depending on your organizational structure. It depends on the base in which you operate. Okay? So this is just some groundwork that's trying to expand our minds a little bit and open uh, ourselves up to different interpretations. Okay? That 234 means something different because your organizational principle is different. Okay, and now I'm going to go somewhere else for a second. I, I, to take you back in time, I don't know how many people out there are old enough to actually have been in a car in which the odometer was analog and not digital. If you were in a car that was analog and not digital, there used to be a moment where dad or mom, whoever was driving, say, kids, look, come up. And this is before the, this is before the days of, uh, of car seats. You're bouncing around in the back. There's six kids in the backpack, as we called it back then, yeah, bouncing sure. around. You're playing like tag in the car. Throwing cash out the window. Dad would say, come on up, and come on up would mean almost climb into the front yep. seat yep. to look at the odometer because something special is going to happen. Right. 
And the special thing that was going to happen is, wait a second, it was called the rollover moment because those numbers are actually on rollers. And normally it's boring when the ones digit or the tenths digit moves. Oh, only one roller moves. Mm -hmm. But at this rollover moment here, that extra mile causes the whole thing to turn over. That 99,999 miles there, you add one to that system, all of a sudden you need a new placeholder. You need to go to the next power of 10 to get to, to actually express it as a decimal. So it's a special element. The entire thing rolled over. Yep. So the rollover moment, base 10, occurs when you have all nine. So let's think about what that says. That says on the odometer we just looked at, that 99,999 base 10, if you add a 1 to it, you get 100,000. I got a question, Mr. Jones. Is that why Mickey Mouse always confuses Halloween and Christmas? <laughs> doing. Yeah, his, his calendar doesn't work very well. I think you're right. That's Michael. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. It, it's, it's hard measuring things when, when, when you only got eight fingers. <laughs> All right, back on track I here. I thought we said we weren't supposed to let Michael Groom be in. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll call him. We'll, we'll make a, We'll call him Unicycle Boy, there you and, go. and, and he'll right. know what we Unicycle mean by that. Unicycle Boy, he will we'll, know that. Um, okay, <laughs> so let's let's parse what that means. Each one of those each one of those numbers there in the ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine counts a power of ten. So the number on the four left is nine ten to the fourth, the the which is ten thousands. And then the second nine counts how many thousands? Ten to the thirds. And what we've done is we've just broken apart the organizational structure and show that what we really said is nine times ten to the fourth plus nine times ten to the third plus nine times ten squared, yada, yada, yada. If you add one to it, it rolls over to the next power of ten. So if you add one to, to the, right, the right moment in the system, it rolls over. And so the question here is, for you out there, I guess for you mouseketeers out there, I guess would be. I know that's pretty sappy, but what does the rollover moment look like in the Mickey Mouse universe? What do you think, Dr. Kelly? What do you think? If you, if in base you 10, powers of eight. in base 10, a string of nines is a magical moment. If you're in base eight, where, when, when, when you got nowhere else to go? Strings of seven. Thank you, Magical. Dr. Kelly. The Mickey Mouse, if in Mickey Mouse's car, and he says, "Hey, kitties, come over. Look, it's about to roll over." Right? They, they, I think you need to stick with Andre the Giant. That's about Mickey, I think. The, they, they, the rollover moment for Mickey Mouse is when you have a string of sevens. If you have a string of sevens, you add one to that system. You got to go over to the next digit position. That's what happens. Base eight. So what is that really saying? Well, if you parse that, it really says that 7 times 8 to the 4th plus 7 times 8 to the 3rd plus 7 times 8 squared, etc. If you add 1 to it, you get to the next power of 8. Right. That's, that's, that statement there is supposed to look as ordinary to us obvious. as the rollover moment base 10. It obvious. is obvious in base 8. And so now the provocative question, because we sort of forgot what the original question was. The original question was, why is it that if I add up powers of 2, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus... 16, for example, I get 31, which is one smaller than the next power of 2. What does a rollover moment look like base 2? If you're in a binary world, I mean, all the computer nerds out there are like, ooh, binary, no problem. What's going on here? It looks like all 1s. If I have a string of 1s base 2 and I add 1 to that system, that's a rollover moment. And you've got to go over to the next digit position. Or if we choose to rearrange that, let's write this so that we have a minus 1 on the other side. Because remember, we had a number that was 1 smaller than a magical number uh, in our conjecture. So now what I want to do is I want you to think about what does 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 base 2 equals 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 base 2 minus 1 really mean? If we break that apart and think about what it's saying base 10. So powers of 2. It's saying that 1 times 2 to the 4th plus 1 times 2 to the 3rd plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 1 times 2 to the 0 is 1 times 2 to the 5th, take away 1. We'll do out that multiplication. It says 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 is equal to 32 minus 1. Or if you read the numbers from right to left instead of left to right, it says that 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 is equal to the next power of 2 minus 1 because it was primed. It was one below the rollover moment, right? Or it was at the rollover moment. Wow, me. that's mundane. That's ordinary. <laughs> Let's think about what we, what we, we just did here. That's Let's so see if cool. we can understand this. Whoops. Click and okay. If we change our perspective to base 2, 
if we look at that and think about an organizational structure based on twos, then the statement 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, uh-oh, I should say 32 minus 1. Oops. <laughs> Everybody, they, that well, should be, yeah. say 32 that minus should say one. 32 minus 1, not 31 minus 1. Oh, a blunder. That's okay. Or more generally, that if you add up the powers of 2 up to a stopping point, you get the next power of 2 minus 1. That is no more surprising than saying that 99,999 is equal to 100,000 minus 1. Yeah. They really say the same kind of statement, just from a different perspective, under a different organizational structure. Cool. And... Okay, I have, a, I have a, uh, a challenge. What do decimals mean when you go in a different base? What is point one 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 forever and ever base 2 equals 1? What does that mean? If I ask you to think about this statement right now, and I'm saying it equals 1, could you tell me what is the base 10 analog to that kind of statement? What statement looks mundane in base 10 that you guys know about? And what does this actually say? What is point one repeating base two equals one? What is that saying about a familiar family of fractions that you guys know about? So we'll leave that out there dangling. Um, and uh, and at that point, I guess we're done with I our we're done with our with our, with our, with our presentation. Yeah, you can but, ask um, questions. Yeah, you can ask us questions if you have any. Let's see, who's here? Um, oh, Papa. Uh, questions. There we go. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah, but thanks if, for listening, if, everyone. If if you guys um, you know want to email us also at some point if you have any questions about uh, things, but if there are any math questions out there concerning any of the problems, we'll stick around for a, a couple minutes to see if anybody has anything they want to chime in about. Feel free to type in questions, everyone. We're just reading some of the comments here. Let's see. Your volume is off, Mr. Jones. Oh. <laughs> Can you repeat all four topics you covered? Thanks, son. <laughs> Vicki, do we oh, have Amy, Amy, just tell us what he did, or? I think oh, well. kidding. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, she got a smiley face back. Oh. I summary. They want a kidding. summary. Oh, oh. Okay, they, I think they 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 they, t they came in late. I think maybe. Oh, maybe they did. Okay. Tough to keep track. So, how about a summary yeah. for everyone? Well, we talked about Just how. The title. Yeah, of the titles yeah. of the four topics. Well, I started out with a problem about how you can use um, two different approaches for counting a particular thing, and that is to do with choosing meals at a restaurant if you're allowed to opt out of particular categories. Um, it was a combinatorics problem. And I talked about, um, about thinking about multiplication from a, a visual geometric perspective and then using that to solve the famous Gauss problem of adding up uh, the first 100 digits or, or in general the first n digits. And then I had a, another problem uh, about clock face, the clock face um, and asked at what exact time, uh, between 1 and 2 o'clock, but it really doesn't matter in a way, at what exact time between 1 and 2 o'clock does the hour hand and the minute hand um, land right on top of each other? And then uh, finally I began with this um, changing your perspective, changing your base to understand by adding powers of 2 um, up together will give you the next power of 2 minus 1. I have to say I look very suave there. <laughs> you do. I don't. I don't usually. So. Um, oh, did I lose it for you? Maybe I had the options. Q and A. Is that is that is that what we wanted to see now? There we go. It's back. Is there a geometric proof oh, of yeah. the last topic? There are lots of proofs of the, 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 the last The last topic, yes. the powers of two, yeah, yeah. It, it was about finite geometric series is what it was. But I There's decided, a beautiful one, yeah, Son. Yeah. There's a beautiful one where you, um, if you make boxes along the x-axis, basically, and you make one box for two to the zero, and then two on top of each other um, are 
with, for two to the one, and then four on top of each other to the right of that um, that are two to the, to the second. And you keep going with that, and you can see that you can stack all of them up. There's a way of seeing stacking it's consecutive ones on top. Sort of an inductive proof. In that it is an way. inductive proof um, because you can see that the first box and the second uh, and the, the next two boxes stack them on top. You get three. Um, and you can just kind of keep going along there and inductively show uh, that that the uh, that, that geometric sum is what it is. Sort of like a fractal. That's what you sort of like a fractal. It is kind of, I guess. Yeah, actually it is. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And dimension Q is five minus two. Yes, that is what it is. I wondered if there are probably lots of other ways to do it too. These yeah, there's that, there's, there's, all of the problems actually that we picked have many different ways of being interpreted, which is kind of why we picked them. That's that's our favorite kind. There's a, there's a couple of really pretty books called Proofs um, Without Words that, mm -hmm. that that are exactly doing what you asked on about geometric proofs. For, for how formulas hold, just giving you some geometric insight into into various number relationships. And actually, so. one of my favorite books is, is um, by John Conway, who's a Princeton mathematician that maybe some of you have heard of. He's he's uh, eminent, and uh, he wrote a book called The Book of Numbers. And in it, he goes through the uh, the Dr. Kelly proof. Basically, um, he, he talks about how different sums of different kinds of numbers can be found by thinking about little balls being added up and stacked and and turned into geometric solids. It's a really cool book um, and very accessible. Um, so, as well as the one that, that Chris is talking about, it's very accessible. So we recommend them. Krishana has answered San's question by saying, I, I believe Krishana is saying, think of an n-dimensional cube of size length two. Might be on a fulcrum. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on where you place the fulcrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I believe Guitar Hero will be in there. And then well, Guitar Hero will be in there. She says, says Dr. Kelly. Yes. <laughs> At light speed. <laughs> do you want to wish everyone well? we'll do yeah. This again. Thank you all so much for, for showing up. And uh, and come and see us. We're, we're in the math office most of the time. Um, so we love to see you all and, and to talk to people that we've taught and talk to people who, who we didn't. Um, it's, it's one of the most gratifying parts of this job is, is seeing young and, and not so young alums. Thanks, guys. Are you going to be doing another webcast? Sure, if you'd like to. We'd love to have you. We'll be, you know, 10 o'clock tonight, we'll start another one. <laughs> <laughs> Fractals and all. Yeah. We'll work on another one. There you go. There you go. Cool. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Happy and, uh, holidays, and again, everyone. And, and come and visit us. Thank you, Vicki. Thanks, Vicki.